Every time in the past I've been tempted to think we've reached peak woke, something even crazier happens. If anyone speaks up against this, you have to shut them down. You can't have a debate. You can't have a discussion. You have to, you have to cancel them. Is the Western culture in, in danger in your point of view? Welcome to a new episode, Deep Dive, today with Konstantin Kissin. Hi, Konstantin. Hey, Mark. Good to be with you. Yeah, thank you for your time. It's great having you. It's an honor, actually. And um, about your background, I want to introduce you to our German audience, because I think it's the first time you're in a German YouTube channel, and I'm very... Guten Tag. Here we go. Can we do this in German? Uh, no, I studied German at school, but I studied it in England where foreign languages are not taught very well. So, and also since then, I didn't, I don't know if you know this, but it's, it's almost like in your brain, you have a compartment for foreign languages. So I learned German at school. And then when I learned Italian later, now when I try to speak German, Italian comes out. So no, th that's the long answer to your question, which is no. <laughs> okay, it it's a pity, actually. <laughs> your background, actually, you are a Russian-British comedian and um, author and host of the podcast called Trigonometry. Um, you're also a daily contributor to newspapers such as the Daily Telegraph. Um, you're born in Moscow, is this right? Uh, that's right. Yeah, you speak that's Russian right. as well? Yeah. Oh, okay, P cool. Um, and you're doing um, stand-up comedian, uh, you're stand-up comedy guy. And um, I, yeah, I, I haven't done it for a while. I stopped uh, during the pandemic. Okay, but we can start today again or we can restart. No, just kidding. We're, we're doing it now, yeah. Actually, I found you because uh, um, 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 you gave a speech in Oxford, of course. You know, it went viral and um, titled um, Why Woke Culture Has Gone Too Far. So yeah. let me ask you first, what does woke culture mean? And secondly, why has it gone too far? Mm. Well, just so you know, it wasn't a speech. Uh, I was part of a debate. So I was invited to, to give my opinion about this issue. And actually, uh, as you're about to discover, I'm quite tired of talking about it, even though it does need to be talked about. So what is woke culture? I mean, there is a hundred different ways you could talk about it. Um, the main aspects of it, I would say, are first of all, Uh, a re-racialization of society. So we were moving in, certainly in the Anglosphere and Western societies towards the idea, ma the Martin Luther King dream, that everybody should be treated on the content of their character. In other words, your sex, your sexuality, your skin color shouldn't matter. Uh, and they don't matter for the purposes of employment, for the purposes of education, for the purposes of what you're allowed to think and say. It doesn't matter if you're black or white. Well, wokeness, part of it is about reversing that and saying, actually, no, we don't want to treat people as individuals. What we want to focus is on what is your race? What is your sex? What is your sexuality? And depending on where you rank in that order, you get certain privileges or you get certain punishments, essentially. So that's one part of it. The other part of it, because this is quite unpopular, you have to Uh, you have to find a way to enforce this and the way you enforce this I don't know what the situation is in Germany you mentioned before we started that it's diversity day in Germany well diversity equity and inclusion or as I call it die uh, this is now part of of the corporate world whereby this ideology of re-racializing society is actually enforced where you have quotas for certain groups where you have Uh, promotions for certain groups. In the BBC, for example, here in Britain, uh, they openly advertise for jobs that exclude certain races from applying. Uh, there are In America, there are universities and colleges that exclude or punish certain people for their ethnicity. If, so, for example, if you're Asian, if you're Jewish, or if you're white, you are unlikely uh, to succeed with the same score as a person who doesn't fit those categories, right? So, re-racialize, uh, implement through various regulations and rules. And then the most important thing, and the thing that really bothered me, which is how I came into this from a purely comedy background, is if anyone speaks up against this, you have to shut them down. You can't have a debate. You can't have a discussion. Cancel you, culture, have to, yeah. you have to cancel them. You have to prevent them from speaking. You have to say, well, you know, you're this or that, and therefore you're not allowed to have an opinion about this issue. So what I've been doing for the last five years since we started trigonometry is using my immigrant privilege 
as I call it, uh, to actually call some of this out because it really does need to be challenged, Mark. Um, you know, this this is antithetical to the liberal Western idea. The very idea of liberalism is that the individual is the right level at which you should analyze things and the right level at which you should direct your policies. So collectivism, identity politics, these are not the way we should be doing things. Uh, and someone needs to say something about it, which is why I've been doing that. Yeah, and you did, and it was really successful because your speech, your debate, uh, actually went totally uh, wild and viral, and I've seen it, many million other people saw it, and many people agreed, but the narrative is here exactly the, the, the opposite. It's If you watch uh, BBC or if you um, read um, the, the Times, it's like we all have to be woke. It's, 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 it's a zeitgeist, for example, and if you're not woke, uh, then you're actually a, a Nazi or whatever, a fascist or something. Something like that. So, um, isn't so let, let let me play devil's advocate. So, isn't it good to be woke to be successful? Because woke means in the narrative that you're awake, that you are progressive, that you pay attention to the feelings and needs of minorities and people, and it also implies that you are care about other people. And um, who could be against it? So, am I wrong? Uh, no, you're not wrong. I think you're exactly right that people should care about others and uh, we should all be looking to end discrimination against minorities and make sure that men and women are treated equally and, and so on. Uh, but the question is, where does your caring lead you? Does your caring lead you to do things that are constructive or does your caring lead you to do things that are destructive? And as we've just talked about, if the desire to protect uh, minorities like me from discrimination leads you to discriminate against other people. In other words, instead of eliminating discrimination, what you're doing is you're changing who is being discriminated against. I don't see that as constructive. I think that is very destructive. And particularly if you play the movie forward, as we say, if you look at how that is likely to have an impact. I mean, one of the, the sort of Uh, the priests, the high priests of, of woke culture is this guy called Ibrahim X. Kendi in America. And he says that the solution to past discrimination is present discrimination. What they never think about, though, is what happens when present discrimination becomes past discrimination? If the solution to past discrimination is to discriminate, well, what about the people you're discriminating against now? You think they're just going to sit there and take it forever? Or is it possible that at some point they get tired of being discriminated against and then you get a backlash and then you have a, a whole world of problems that you don't want? So, uh, yes, uh, the, the fact that people on the progressive left really do care about others, I think is really important. That's an instinct, uh, I think, that is healthy. Uh, the question is how you direct it. Are you directing it into things that make the world better? Or are you directing it into tearing people down and ending people's careers for making the wrong joke and so on? And I don't think that's healthy at all. Mm, yeah, yeah, you're right, actually. And if I look in my surrounding, um, I don't see too many people who um, live this wokeness, actually, you know, they, they don't, don't use pronouns or gender or something like that. And I have people in the in the um, homosexual community and all the other uh, punk rock and, and left wing liberals, anything conservatives, but I don't think it matters actually in reality. So what do you think? Did we see already the, the, the peak of woke? Is it getting less in the future or you think it's just the beginning? Well, I don't know. Uh, I honestly really don't know. Uh, every time in the past I've been tempted to think we've reached peak woke, something even crazier happens. Uh, so it's very, very hard to say. Uh, I honestly don't know. I think the truth is that people uh, who understand what is going on have to simply do what they do in order to oppose these ideas, to challenge them robustly, uh, to make sure that our laws don't reflect this worldview and so on. Uh, and then probably in retrospect, 20 or 30 years from now, we'll be able to look back and say that was the peak moment or this was the peak moment. Uh, I've always said from day one um, that the thing that will break all of this is the trans issue. Uh, for very obvious reasons, because the level of denial of reality that is required to go along with it uh, is so high. And also because you're messing with people's children. Uh, once you start doing that, you're going to lose a lot of people. And I, I see this all the time. You know, I, I go into TV studios and I 
sit in green rooms with, with various people from left and right. And, you know, my, even on the left, the vast majority of people don't buy into this uh, craziness. So that will be the issue that breaks it. Uh, when that happens, I would have thought it should have happened years ago. Uh, when that happens, we'll find out. Yeah. So, and how was the reaction to your speech or to your debate? Um, how was, was there a backlash? Was there a shitstorm coming? No, no. I, look, I, I people loved it. I, the, it was one of those times when you get you know universally positive feedback. Of course, if I really want to find someone who's upset with it, I can. Uh, but generally speaking, the reaction was very, very positive. And I think partly, you know, I hope you and your audience can tell from this, the conversation we're having is I'm really a reasonable person. I, I'm not trying to annoy people for the sake of annoying them. I don't have the desire to... Uh, you know, trigger lots of people. Uh, that's really not what I want. I want to persuade people. And so what I did with the Oxford speech uh, in that debate was to, tr to try and say to people, okay, look, some of you here are woke, which I really appreciate. If you came to listen to this debate, uh, that's great. Now, if you're woke, you care about certain things. Let's look at, are your ideas actually help helping to solve those problems or not? And I think that's really uh, the message that I have is if you want to make the world a better place, that's a very good thing for young people to want to do. And young people have always done this. I would hope that our children also want to make the world a better place. The question is, are you doing it in a way that is actually working or are you just making yourself feel good? That's really the difference, right? And screaming and shouting and preventing other people from saying what they think and calling them names, that, you know, that makes you feel very good. It makes you feel very righteous. Does it actually achieve anything? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you said you don't want to trigger people, but your podcast is called Trigonometry. Uh, you're doing it together with Francis Foster. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps you can uh, tell our audience, what is this podcast all about? What's the intention? Well, that's right. So the intention is, isn't to say, you know, we're going to go around and trigger lots of people. You we've got to remember when five years ago we started this uh, podcast in a room above a comedy club, uh, we were working in this very progressive comedy industry. Um, and so what we were saying with the name trigonometry wasn't we're going out to, to, to annoy lots of people. What we were saying is some of the issues we cover on the show may be offensive. So in some ways, it's actually quite funny because the name of, of the channel is actually a trigger warning in and of itself. We're saying, you know, you might find this offensive. We do try and talk about difficult issues. We do try to uh, discuss things that other people struggle to discuss. And the reason that we're able to do that is we do it in a long form way. So the slogan of our, of our, of our YouTube show is honest conversations with fascinating people. And that's what we try to do. We talk to a lot of people uh, on the left. We talk to a lot of people on the right. We talk to sports people about sports and, you know, evolutionary biologists about evolution and, and all sorts of different things. So it's not just about politics. And um, yeah, we just want to create an opportunity for people to actually be heard. Uh, and, you know, whether we're talking to somebody who's on the left, who, who's talking about how the rich have too much power and too much control. And we had a guy called Darren McGarvey on the show recently to make that point. Or whether we're talking to someone like Nigel Farage, who a lot of people wouldn't like on the left particularly. But if they have something interesting to say, we find that, that the best thing that we can do is show that they're a human being with rounded views that you can actually listen to as opposed to this two two second soundbite of how evil they are. You know, we haven't found, we have interviewed many, many people with different political views. We haven't found that many actually evil people. What we have found is there are a lot of people who differ in their views about how to make society better. And those are the debates we feel that, uh, you know, our societies need. We should be talking about, you know, is it low tax or is it high tax? Is it this approach to, to dealing with underprivileged communities or is it that approach? You know, when we talk about sexual minorities that you mentioned, you know, do we, do we do this or do we do that? That's the way we should be having the conversation. And that's what we're trying to do. So trying to bring sanity back, essentially, to the way that we have these discussions. Yeah, that's my intention as well, to talk with everybody, because that's actually what we yeah, didn't do the last couple of years, especially mm. since COVID. So um, there was no um, discourse anymore, no more talking to each mm. other. It was just fighting and screaming or mm. cancel culture. And I think democracy it's talking about everything and and listening to the other part of the story as well and and there's always 
perhaps the truth is in the middle. Nobody has the right to say, hey, I know the truth by, by my own. So, yeah, that's very great, actually, your intention for the podcast. And I will definitely um, put a link in the show notes. And it's very um, interesting to listen to you and Francis' um, podcast. So... Um, would you agree with the slogan, go woke, go broke? Because we saw a lot of those um, companies who tried to be woke and we saw a backlash like Budweiser and uh, many other companies. So is go woke, go broke right? Is it the right slogan? I think it really depends. I think it depends on what your product is. I mean, woke people also buy things. So if you want to sell your very woke products to 10% of, of the public, which is about what they represent, uh, you, you could probably make a living doing that. Um, but generally speaking, I guess what, what people mean when they say go woke, go broke is that they're talking about big companies that, that try to sell you know products that all of us buy, leaning so heavily into this ideology. And I, I don't know that it's always true, uh, but I do think sometimes it's true. And I think that's a good thing. I, I do think I, I'm not a massive fan of like boy, you know, organizing massive boycotts. Uh, I don't know if you followed the story, but our bank account was recently uh, canceled by our bank. Um, and, you know, we haven't called for, for people to boycott them. What we have said, though, is, I mean, this is what's happened to us, you know, You, and it's up to you then to consider whether you want to have your bank account with a bank that's going to cancel it for whatever reason they have. So uh, I don't know that it's always been true. And I think we've actually gone through a period of time where a lot of these companies have felt very empowered to, to move in this political direction. Uh, hopefully some of the recent events that you've talked about uh, will make them think twice about it. Mm. So due to, to your um, background, you know the, the Eastern world as well. So is wokeness actually something that is ha only happening in the, in the Western culture, in the Western world? Predominantly, yes. Yeah, predominant, which is why it's so dangerous to, actually, to us, actually, because uh, I, I've made this point many times. While we are busy teaching our children to hate their own country, there are other societies out there that are not doing that. And so... Uh, if we are to compete effectively on the global stage, it's quite hard to do that when you don't believe in yourself or the values of your own society. Um, so, yeah, I think it's primarily uh, is primarily an English speaking phenomenon, actually. And look, I, you, you probably tell me more about what's happening in Germany. Um, I don't know how, how rife it is over there, but it, it does seem to me to be a much more Western thing than, than, than not. Yeah. You still have like contacts to 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 Russia or to to Eastern Europe, and you know how it is handled there. As is there something you can uh, share with us? Yeah, well, I have a family in Russia and Ukraine and Armenia and all over the former Soviet Union. It's really not that much of a problem over there, from from what I know. Okay, they have yeah. different problems. Yeah, talking about um, Russia. Oh, well, they have very different problems. You're right about that. Yeah, yeah that exactly. one they don't have. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let me ask about, it came up in my mind um, because of the war in Ukraine. Um, it's very political, of course, but um, you, you're born in Russia. You have relatives in all these countries in Ukraine and in Russia. So um, there seems to be only in, in the media, um, like only black and white, you know, it's like mm. um, we have to send billions of dollars and, and euros and pounds and we have to send weapons and in the in the past if somebody was for for peace it was a good thing actually now in germany um, if you're for peace right now you are an, a, a nazi yeah and the the left wings and the green party in germany they support uh, deliveries of weapons and they support the war and it's like okay what's going on i'm I, did i left the matrix or did i take drugs something changed yeah because for me the green party was always about peace and about um anti-nuclear power plants and so on and now everything switched is it the same in the uk and what's your take out of this Uh, well, how how is uh, not having nuclear plants worked out for Germany so far? Uh, not very well, from what I hear. That you're buying coal from South Africa after you paid them a billion dollars from Russia um, <laughs> <laughs> and Russia, right? Uh, so uh, uh, I, I I don't really take much credence from what those people say. Look, um, I I understand the point you're making. I think um, I I do think it's much more complex than that. From my perspective, I am very much in favor of supporting Ukraine. Uh, 
I, uh, in, in this conflict, uh, because I don't really think that there is a peace option on the table right now. Um, so you, you, we could uh, abandon the Ukrainians, in which case they're, they're going to fight as, as hard as they can and get slaughtered. But that isn't really peace either. And from my perspective, the reason that we should be supporting them is that this already happened in 2014. We didn't really uh, do anything. And so Russia has come back for more. And if this, this conflict isn't settled in a long term way now, you are just going to find yourself in this position a few years down the line again. Uh, I agree with you, though. The media is very black and white. It's a function of, of the way that the media is. Uh, you can't really have uh, a genuine discussion about it. I've just uh, recorded a, de a debate with uh, my friend Michael Malice and a, a, an American guy called Dave Smith about the, 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 the Russia and Ukraine situation. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm not one of the people who thinks that we should... Uh, not support Ukraine in this conflict. But equally, I do think people should be allowed to express their opinion about it without being called names. Uh, I do think they're wrong. Doesn't mean that they're bad people. Mm. So you knowing the, the Russian soul and perhaps even Putin more than perhaps me and, and, and our audience. So what did we miss or what did we, what we didn't understand or misunderstood in the last couple of years? So what do you think what happened or... Um, What do you think is his motivation? Because uh, they, they say something different than we say. So where's the truth? Perhaps you can elaborate well, I, this. I don't know Vladimir Putin personally, but <laughs> so I don't know anything more about that aspect of it than you do. But uh, from from a political geopolitical perspective, uh, yes, uh, Russia isn't happy about uh, NATO expansion. Uh, and hasn't ever been happy about it. But Russia has never had the ability to do anything about that until recently. The reason that Vladimir Putin feels much felt felt quite wrongly more emboldened is because of the dictatorial system that he operates, where accurate information never really goes up the up the chain of command. So he was only really hearing the things that he wanted to hear from his uh, intelligence people and from his. Uh, military people. And so the reason that Russia went in to Ukraine and, and failed as quickly as they did was they expected to take the country in a matter of days. That is actually, that's what they tried to do. That's why they landed their paratroopers, their airborne troops. They wanted to control the key airports, uh, capture Zelensky, decapitate the regime and take over the country. They already had people like Viktor Medvedchuk lined up to take over Ukraine, who are these um, pro-Russian people they've been funding for, for decades. And they found out that all of their predictions about the way the war was going to go were completely wrong. And that's because of the system in which accurate information isn't uh, able to move up. Uh, the other reason is Vladimir Putin's been in power for a very long time now. You know, I, I always remind people, Vladimir, came to, uh, Vladimir Putin came to power when in the West we were worried about the millennium bug. Do you remember that? A very long time ago. And so what happens as you consolidate more power, Russia has done this throughout history. As the Russian state becomes more powerful, it looks outwards. It looks to rebuild its empire, to recapture its lost territories. It, it looks to... Um, you know, make sure that, uh, that, that any, any, any territories which could be described as formerly part of Russia are again formerly part of Russia. And the third reason is Vladimir Putin is a victim of his own success. Uh, Vladimir Putin came in in 1999 at a time when Russia was in a really bad way. And thanks in large part to uh, rising oil prices, but also in, in the fact that he Uh, he took strong control of the country, which in many ways is what Russia needs. He dealt with the oligarchs. He dealt with a lot of the corruption, not not by eliminating it, but by nationalizing the corruption. Um, he stabilized the country. People's living standards went up. People's economic prosperity went up. And so once a country becomes economically prosperous, people go, well, look, okay, look, when, when we had terrorism and a war in Chechnya and the country was down the toilet, We needed we needed this authoritarian strong leader, but now now everything's fine, right? Why do why do we need this guy who who's who's going to stay in power forever? And that's when you have to start finding uh, a foreign enemy, 
because then you can say, look, the reason you need me is those bad guys over there who are coming to to attack Russia. Uh, and so it's a combination of factors um, uh, that, that, that cause this invasion. Uh, and some of them are some of them are legitimate complaints. I mean, uh, NATO's expansion eastwards was never going to be uh, welcome in, by Russia. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it shouldn't have happened. I mean, if you if you if you're against all NATO expansion, then Russia would probably be on Germany's borders right now. I mean, Vladimir Putin keeps talking about how um, you know the evil Americans are undoing the post World War Two order. Well, the post World War Two order was all of Eastern Europe was subjugated by what is now Russia, including East Germany, as you know even better than I do. So, uh, if if that's what if that's what people are happy with, then that's fine. But I, I don't think that's a good outcome for Eastern or Central Europe, personally. Um, so we are where we are. And at this point, the question is, where do we want to end up? Uh, that's been the, the question I've been saying to people from day one. OK, you don't want to support Ukraine. Fine. What, what is the, what is the outcome that you want? Do you want to be in this position five or ten years from now when there's more parts of Ukraine being bitten off? Do you want to be emboldening uh, a dictator who's expanding into his neighboring countries or not? Uh, th these are all very hard choices. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's especially um, right now interesting times. So let's switch the topic to something different. Um, you as a comedian, do you see any limit or is there a border of good taste to make jokes about? Is there a limit you have or do you think it's just you can say whatever you want? You can make jokes about uh, disabled people, about war, about everything, Holocaust or whatever. Uh, it's a, both. Uh, you can make jokes about anything, but I also have my own limits about what I do and don't joke about. Uh, so... Uh, the thing about comedy that people usually don't understand is comedy is very self-regulating. Like, if I make a joke that people don't like, I am going to get that feedback and not probably not do that joke again. Because even even if you're trying to be, you know, provocative as a comedian, you're not actually trying to get people to hate you. Right? You're never trying to do that. You're trying to make people laugh. And so... Comedy is quite self-regulating, but of course there are limits. But at the same time, the, the, in my opinion, I don't want them imposed by a mob. I don't want a bunch of people uh, to scream and shout at you for making the wrong joke. Because when you're making jokes, inevitably sometimes you go too far, sometimes you cross the line, sometimes you say something that people don't like. And we've kind of got to the point where we treat people as like disposable. You know, you made one mistake. Okay, we throw you in the rubbish. Well, that I, I don't. I don't think that's a mature way of dealing it. Some, with it. You know, a comedian can make a bad joke, and we can all go, "Well, that that wasn't funny," or "I didn't like that," or I, "You know, someone was upset by that," or whatever. And uh, and then that comedian can learn from that. We don't need to destroy their life, and we don't need to destroy the lives of ordinary people who made a joke that didn't land well. I mean, as a comedian, most of the time. You, you write material, you go on stage, you try it, and nine out of ten jokes don't work, right? That's how it works. So you've got to be able to, to try and experiment and, and, and um, play around with ideas without feeling like you're walking on the edge of a cliff. Mm -hmm. You said you're not doing any stand-up comedian anymore since COVID. You're planning to do it again or it's just over and you concentrate on, on trigonometry on the podcast? Well, uh, I'm, uh, I wrote a book, which I'm uh, fortunate to say was a Sunday Times bestseller last year called An Immigrant's Love Letter to the West. I'm working on a second book. Uh, I, I, I probably won't surprise you that after my Oxford speech, I've been invited to uh, give talks at a bunch of different places around the world. So uh, I've got a one-year-old son now as well. So the, the problem with comedy is I always enjoyed being on stage, but the, the travel that it, you basically four or five nights a week you leave the house at like five in the afternoon you don't get home until two in the morning you're driving a lot uh it just w wasn't a lifestyle for a young family uh that, that was really ever going to work so uh I, i have i i love my life now way more than i did when i was just doing stand-up i really enjoy doing the youtube show i enjoy doing my tv appearances writing on my Substack. Uh, i i'm really looking forward to writing my second book which is going to be about gratitude um and 
uh, you know, I've got all sorts of amazing creative projects under trigonometry. We're going to start doing things other than just interviews. We're going to start making documentaries and all sorts of other things using the, the audience that we have uh, to, to create really cool stuff. So uh, I've got like so many cool things that I can do. Uh, the appeal of comedy is, is less now. Yeah. So um, mentioning your, your your first book, your first best-selling book, actually, I also will put a link in the show notes, of course. Um, you, you, you made a love letter to the Western culture, actually. So what is it? Tell, tell us, uh, give us an elevator pitch about um, why do you love the West? Well, uh, I, the, the first thing that I do in the book is I say to people, everything is, we have a saying in Russian, everything is understood in comparison. And so I tell people about my experience of growing up. Uh, not in the West, because I think the easiest way to understand how fortunate we are uh, to live in, in the West is to compare it to other places in which you might live. And I don't know if you saw the story, there was this American basketball player, Brittany Griner, I think her name is. Um, she was arrested in Russia and held there for a while. And she was one of these people who refused to stand for the national anthem and so on. Well, she's come back now to America. And guess what? She's going to stand for the national anthem. So that contrast is the first thing I try to provide is, you know, when you say the West is bad and wrong and evil and racist and whatever, what are you comparing it to exactly? Um, that's the first thing. And then the other thing I talk about is why is the West as successful as it has been? And I talk about some of the values that we have. And we talked about one of them already, which is Uh, the sanctity of the individual, but with sanctity individual of the individual also comes freedom. And that means freedom to research, freedom to pursue scientific uh, inquiry, freedom to speak your mind. These are all of the things that make us who we are and allow us to be as successful as we have been. So I talk a lot about, you know, the importance of honest journalism, something we haven't had much of for, for the last many years uh, and all sorts of other things in the book. So if people want to check it out, I recommend it. Yeah, definitely. It's worth reading it as well as of uh, your podcast and your YouTube channel, of course, as well. So um, what do you think? Is there is, is democracy, is the Western culture in, in danger in your point of view? Yes. Yes, it is. I think um, if you have a society, the, the way I always think about this, Mark, is this. If you don't believe that what you have is valuable, why would you defend it? Like if you thought that the house you live in is terrible and actually it should be torn down, if someone comes along and starts tearing it down, you probably wouldn't even stop them, right? And so the reason I think it's very dangerous uh, what's going on is that we are teaching, as I said before, our children to hate their own society. And that means they're not going to be willing to stand up and fight for it, whether that's intellectually or physically or whatever. And so I think it's really important for, for us to recapture the sense of, yes, you know, we know that nationalism and uh, a sort of unhealthy version of patriotism is bad. We've seen that throughout the 20th century. Uh, but on the other hand, It doesn't mean that loving your country and being proud of its positive sides is unhealthy or bad. We have to find the right balance between those two. And I just feel that we are teetering far too much to the side of being too self-deprecating, too navel-gazing, too much time spending looking in the mirror and going, oh, look how ugly and terrible we are. I think we have to have a, a healthy view of ourselves. Uh, and understand that, yes, we're not perfect. Yes, many, many terrible things have happened in, in Western countries. But if you compare that with what's happening around the world, we're actually pretty good. We're good people. I mean, this idea, for example, we, we talk endlessly now about, you know, equality. The idea of equality really doesn't exist anywhere else. Like the idea, for example, that like a gay man and a straight man are equal doesn't exist in Russia. Right. It just it, it, it's it, no, it would never occur to people, to the vast majority of people to think that way. It's a Western idea that we thankfully have implemented the idea that people should be treated equally, irrespective of of their, you know, who they are, how they live their life, etc. Um, so if we don't stand up for that, no one else in the world will. And so this is what I always say to woke people is like, if you care about racism, if you care about sexism, if you care about all those things, you must defend the West with everything you have, because those are the only places that anyone cares about it. Yeah. 
So, so how did we get there? Actually, we are saturated. Um, is it decadency? What happened? Why did we fall for it? Why did we get there in this um, yeah narrow street? Well, I think we're very comfortable, as you say, uh, in relative terms. And so when you're comfortable, it's very tempting. Like if, if you, 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 you would have met people like that who grew up with money and they never had to really work and they don't tend to be, uh, they, they often are the ones that are very critical of the society in which they grew up in because we're always looking for something to push against when we're young, especially. So I think partly it's comfort. But the other thing is, uh, I think really this explosion and there's data to, to confirm this, this explosion happens due to social media. When social media comes along, um, what you start to see is ideas that sound good but aren't true get rewarded and ideas that are true but sound uncomfortable or unpleasant, uh, they are the ones that are punished online. So, for example, the idea that, you know, all things to all men, everyone should be equal, everyone should have the same income, everyone should be comfortable, no one should be poor, no one should go hungry, no one should, no one should, no one should. That, who can disagree with that, right? It sounds great. What about the idea that you are responsible for your own life? you're responsible for making of your life what you wish. And if you don't, that's your responsibility, not mine, right? That doesn't sound good, but we know which one of those is true and which isn't. Uh, but social media privileges ideas that, that are wrong, uh, that make you feel good and punishes ideas that make you feel bad, even though that they're true. So I think a lot of it has to do with modern technology as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Um, yeah, there, there's also a good and a bad side, of course, of, of this um, revolution about technology and everything mm -hmm. in the internet. So you also have great success on the on the uh, oh. internet and uh, with podcasts and your show. So what do you think, what is the future of corporate media, of the old school media like newspapers, like magazines, and of course, like BBC and, and all the other uh, channels? Well, their market share is plummeting. I think that will probably continue. Uh, certainly with BBC and newspapers and so on, I think, and I don't say this in any disrespectful way, I just think it's a fact that um, generationally speaking, young people are less attached to Uh, to the BBC, for example, we, we know this. And so as time goes on, you'll probably find that the mainstream institutions have less and less influence over what we think and, and what we talk about. And new media, what you're doing, what we're doing, uh, is probably going to be uh, much more in the forefront of this. And, and probably eventually what you'll see is almost like a reconsolidation of new media into new, bigger media organizations uh, that, that reflect a certain worldview or a certain approach or a certain way of doing things. I mean, in America, for example, you already see this with something like the Daily Wire, which is a right wing entertainment and news and politics and culture uh, outlet and i think you're going to start to see more more of that going forward as the big mainstream media institutions lose their audience which i i, I think it's inevitable that they will Yeah, yeah, I agree with you right there. Uh, you wrote, Constantine, you wrote a very r also radical moderate manifesto. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you want to share it with our audience. Well, I wrote it a long time ago, so I wouldn't be able to go through it point by point. But essentially, if you want to go and find it, it's available for free on my Substack. It's called the Radical Moderates Manifesto. And, and the basic point I'm making, you know, is that uh, I think that what we've seen in, in, in the last decade, certainly in, in, in Britain, where I live, is some very obvious things that everybody used to agree on, things like countries need borders and the police should prevent criminals from committing crimes instead of punishing people for you know making the wrong joke or whatever. Some very, very basic and obvious things have become controversial. And so I kind of talk about that uh, because I'm, ba you know, I don't consider myself in any way radical. I think I'm just moderate. Uh, but I, I sort of play with this label of controversial because people keep claiming that I'm controversial even when I'm really, really not. Uh, but yeah, if you want the full list, go and check it out. It's on my Substack, available completely free. Yeah, definitely. I will put it also in the show notes, like your book. It sounds like I'm trying to plug all my stuff, but you just no, no, no. I, I was just reading the stuff, and I just yeah. thought it's definitely worth mentioning it because yeah, it's yeah. it's different, you know, and it's yeah. always good to get new input and that people start to think. So don't worry, it's not like a, a marketing show, and mm. um, I will not put the links in the show notes. No, just kidding. We will do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, great. Um, 
last but not least, so um, what what's what's in your mind right now is the most important point for all of us as a society, as the as the as the global community. Having children. Marvelous. Is it your first one? It is my first one. Um, and I don't mean it just from a personal perspective. We we were misled by people like Paul Ehrlich uh, many years ago who wrote The Population Bomb uh, into thinking that the biggest problem the, the world faces is uh, too many people. Actually, if you look at fertility rates around the West, but not only the West, also in China, also in Russia, we have a big, big problem coming. And if we don't have enough children, uh, it's going to be difficult. On a personal level, it's been an absolute joy for me. Now, he's not a teenager yet. Maybe when he becomes a teenager, I don't know if you have kids, Mark, but uh, I, I might. you've got three? Congratulations. That's awesome. Um, so it's my first. I'm looking forward to, to, to having as many as I can. My wife and I, unfortunately, left it quite late, but uh, keen to get as many out as we can because they're just it, it's it's such a joy. And um, we need, we, you know, this is part of the other thing that makes our this sort of malaise of Western society. It's not a dynamic culture because we don't have as many young people and children coming through and we need them. We're going to need them uh, later down the line. And so, yeah, having children uh, in my look. And by the way, people always, you know, wh whenever you say anything like this, people always freak out and they're like, how dare you tell me like I'm just saying it's been good for me and the planet needs it. I'm not saying you specifically have to have children, uh, but I do think it's it's something we don't talk about enough. And I am using my son because he's very, very cute, uh, basically to shove him in front of everyone to encourage them to have kids. And I, I, I like I bring him everywhere just so that I don't say anything. I just bring him to like friends houses and they all look at him and then go, oh, you know, um, I, so I, I've become a dad fluencer. Uh, I think. And if it wasn't for the fact that I don't want his face to be on social media past about the age of, of what he is now, I'd be putting out sort of dad content every day. Yeah, exactly. And in front of the camera and the interview and everything. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. Uh, exactly. I couldn't agree more with you. I think this is a ticking time bomb, actually, demographics and nobody sees it and nobody addresses it really. And it will be uh, incredible, especially in the Western world. It will be like life changing and the collateral damage we will see in the retirement system and so on will be enormous. Uh, anyhow, I think it's the, the greatest gift actually having kids and they teach me so much more than university and school and everything and I'm just mm. very, very grateful that I made this experience and that I'm allowed to have kids and um, when I see people talking about, oh, we I can have kids, I don't want to have kids uh, or uh, we shouldn't have kids because of climate change and so on, I think, okay, so hey, uh, lay down and die, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the point? And everybody can make his free choice But um, if somebody says oh, he wants to have kids or she wants to have kids, hey, it's okay. It's good. It's perfect, mm. actually. And we need reproduction. And because you said you already have one, you should do another one. That's why we have to stop the interview right now. And you go to work, man, Constantine. Uh, go for absolutely. it. Absolutely. I'll go and talk to my wife right now. And if she's not agreeing, I talk to her. Tell her. No, just kidding. No, Absolutely. it was an absolute blast having you definitely on the show. Because the last question actually would have been, um, what's the meaning of life for Konstantin Kissin? But I think you already answered it, didn't you? I think so. I, I think there's more to it than just children. I think um, now that I've found myself in a position where I can speak to many people, I'm trying to get those that that part of his of the message but just more broadly just to to try and uh have more sensible conversations so that we don't tear our societies apart and so that we don't weaken our societies in the face of external threats which as we have seen in the last couple of years are quite extensive so that's you know my work and my family are, 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 are the sources of uh, fulfillment and meaning for me and uh, attempting to contribute to, to the lives of others in a positive way that's that's really what that what, what does it for me yeah beautiful Good, good speech. And yeah, I think we should talk more in the future with everybody and um, we should listen. And that's actually the foundation of democracy and of humanity. And yeah, we all should learn that. And I definitely have to recommend the stuff Constantine is producing again. And you find all the important links in the show notes. Constantine, I have to say thank you for your time. It was a blast having you. It was an honor. And I hope to talk to you again soon. I really appreciate it, Mark. Thanks for having me.